Well, amen and amen to that. Our Father. Well, happy Father's Day, Bridgeway. Happy Father's Day to all you men out there watching this. Uh, those of us that are remembering our fathers today, uh, today's a great day to celebrate and just take a moment to honor the men that brought us into this world, the men that raised us, the men that have guided us. Happy Father's Day. My name is Dave Heiliger. I'm one of the pastors here at Bridgeway. And first off, I just want to say thanks to Dr. Anderson, who's a spiritual father to so many of us, and uh, father to your three, uh, your three kids. Doc, thank you for giving me this, this opportunity. And uh, just today, I say happy Father's Day to you. Uh, and to all of you here, you know, Father's Day is a day that's really special for me because I am the father of a beautiful young little girl, eight years old. Her name is Reese. She is the light of my life. She is a wonderful uh, mirror copy of me and my beautiful wife, Julie, put together, mashed up, twisted up, and came out as what a high energy little girl. She is uh, my philosophical sparring partner, even at eight years old. She is my adventure buddy. She is a person that cartwheels and does forward rolls wherever she goes. She skips, she hops, she never, ever walks. She loves audiobooks. She loves funny jokes, even when I tell jokes that aren't so funny. You know, being a dad, being a father is something that uh, I just cherish so much. And today we get to talk about fathers. We get to talk about you as dads. And we have some shout outs to dads I want to I wanna tell you about. But uh, you might have one dad or two dads or a bonus dad or a spiritual father or a biological father. You might have a godfather, a stepfather, a father-in-law, a father that has passed on. You might call your dad dad or pops. I remember when Reese used to call me dada or, or daddy, right? Papa. Maybe you're, you're from a culture that might call your dad poppy or abba, appa or baba. Or maybe for you guys is just your old man. You might have a relationship with your dad that's good, bad, non-existent, strained, recovering, or maybe it's just plain complicated. You know, my relationships with uh, the men in my, my life, my dad, my father-in-law, my, my grandfather-in-law, uh, he, it's changing these days. You know, as I'm getting to be in this kind of middle-aged stage coming up in my life, they're getting older, and my relationships with them are, are getting a little bit different. You know, the elder care is coming up now, and, and my relationship, what it looks like to honor my dad, what it looks like to honor my, my father-in-law, my grandfather-in-law, it changes when they need us more than we need them. That's hard, right? It's hard when, when that relationship changes. Even today, you know, the thinking about the strain on the family as, as health issues come up. My father-in-law has been in and out of the hospital for the past couple of months. Even today, got rushed to Hopkins for emergency surgery. Tough times. But we look at these men and we say, I want to honor you. You know, for the many different types of relationships with dads that are out there, the complicated ones, and I know some of, some of us have those complicated relationships, we do want to take a moment and pause and just celebrate the good ones, the good dads, to the dads that are killing it. To the ones that even though they don't have it all figured out, they're all in when it comes to raising their kids. They coach the team. They help with the homework. They're making lunches. They talk about hard things. They model what it's like to have healthy relationships. They discipline with wisdom. They lead family devotions. They take their, the mantle of spiritual covering for their family very seriously. They apologize when they're wrong. They take care of their own health. They give grace to others. They're faithful to their wives. I, their wife. Let's get that straight. Their wife. They don't hesitate to say the words, I love you. To those dads, 
that are exhausted at the end of the day and they just come home and they sit down and they take that sigh of relief. Every now and then, they might even say it's worth it. We can tell that you consciously think about the connection between the way that you parent and what your children and your spouse come to believe about the love of our Heavenly Father. That he loves us the way that he loves us. It's to you, messed up, dressed up, classy sons of guns, happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. You know, I wanted to to bring up uh, the mascot in in my mind of what fathers are represented by, um, at least in my culture. I know some other cultures, it might look a little bit different, but in my culture, there's something that really captures it for me, and it's these. Have you guys seen these? Have you guys seen these? These are affectionately, in, in my culture, called dad shoes, right? And this pair of dad shoes uh, has its own life cycle, right? First, you get the new dad shoes, and they're nice and bright and white. And then after you wear them for a while, then you retire your old dad shoes that have kind of grass stains around them, right? And then these pair become your old pair, and you, then you buy a new pair, and guess what they look like? This exact same pair of dad shoes, And I think we think about dads and we think about walking in their footsteps. And so today, I just want to put these up as a reminder that we walk in your shoes, dad. We pick up where you left off. And when you get all grass stained and creased up, you know, we we come along and we're we're a pair, maybe just like you. Maybe the ones that come after us will be the pair, just like us. And so those of you that are watching online, I want you to maybe right now, even as we think about our dads, maybe you want to give a shout out to your dad, like a real legitimate shout out in the comments section. Maybe right now you might want to put shout out to my dad who dot, dot, dot. Shout out to my dad who did this or did that or was always. And I actually, I reached out to a couple people because I wanted some shout outs to get us started today. I wanted some shout outs. To, from people legitimately shouting out their dad. And Shanira Washington says to her dad, Brian, shout out for being the best dad and my life teacher. Deborah Eubanks says to her dad, Jim Jefferson, thank you for being an amazing dad and father. Blaze and Ellis Walker say to their dad, Lawrence, dad, you're the best dad in the world. We really love giving you hugs. Belinda Eubanks says, daddy, thank you for encouraging me to be me. I love you. Josh Baptist says, shout out to my dad for being my best friend and someone I could go to when I needed truth and wisdom. Lexi Ligon says to her dad, Tyrone, shout out to the secretly sensitive and sentimental dad who tells the worst but best jokes. And Bridget Thornton says to her late dad, Elder Kevin Thornton, a dad to many, she said, thanks for setting the bar so high. Shout out to our dads today. You know, I was thinking about dads as I was just traveling. I was just traveling to the country of Colombia on a great vacation. We have some family that lives in Colombia, from Colombia, and uh, they said, come on down. You and your wife should spend a week with us. We'll travel all around the country. You should come and spend some time with us. And I didn't expect that on my trip there, I would get my message for Father's Day right? Kind of unexpected. We were traveling all around the country in Colombia, and one, one of the legs of our trip, we ended up at the coast, the Caribbean coast, and we were in the town of Santa Marta, and we went on a bus for about two hours down a long road through the Sierra Nevada mountains. Like, we were really getting off the beaten track. No Westerners were around, nobody that looked like And so we went to uh, this, down this far, far road, and the bus just led us off literally on on the side of a road, off kind of in the jungle. And there was a sign that our, my cousin reassured me that it was the sign for our hotel. But it didn't quite look like that at all. It looked like a long dirt path leading right into the jungle. Well, we had some backpacks with all of our stuff uh, packed in there, and we walk about a quarter mile down this long dirt road. And what opened up before us at the end of the road 
was this awesome jungle oasis right at the coast. I mean, blue water, palm trees, the Sierra Nevada mountains in the back, uh, in, in back of us. Then there's this river that was kind of winding through this, this hotel. And they said, don't go in the river because you got to watch out for the alligators. I was like, OK, now we're really in the jungle for real, for real. Well, we get there. The first day is uh, great. The evening is beautiful. We go to the pool. And as we're coming back from the pool, we are admiring. And let me tell you, this is the nighttime. So it's like 10, 11 o'clock at night. We're admiring this cage that has some parrots in it, beautiful, like tropical jungle parrots, like they kept there. And my wife says, uh, I didn't notice that carving there before. And we look, and that carving began to move. And that carving was not a carving, it was a snake. And that snake was not a small snake. And it was not in the cage. We were probably as close as you could get to that snake as if I would ever want to be. Too close. Almost reach out and touch it close. Well, let me tell you, we ran. I mean, I ran, ran away, <laughs> away from it. And I can't tell you if I screamed or not, but I, I won't admit to any of it. But we ran back up to the hotel and told the workers there. And thankfully, they were freaked out, too. They didn't say, oh, that snake, that's John. He lives in the neighborhood. Instead, they freaked out. We all kind of went back, keeping our distance. And they said, we've got to call the guy. I said, who's the guy? <laughs> And we looked around, and there was, there was somebody there, but he was literally, this guy walks up, he's literally carrying a 10-foot pole. Like, not 9 feet, not 8 feet, a 10-foot pole. And I said, is that the guy? They said, oh, that's not the guy. And we're waiting, and we're waiting, and we're, we're looking, and finally, the guy shows up. Broad-shouldered guy, wearing a security shirt. He comes up, and he's carrying a 3-foot stick, and he approaches this, what we come to find out as he's now one hand on the snake, one hand with the stick, getting this thing away from these parrots that apparently live at the hotel. A seven foot long boa constrictor is at our hotel. I gotta tell you, we were in the jungle then. And I was looking at this guy and I thought, oh my goodness, his shirt doesn't even say boa constrictor handler. It says security. It wasn't even in his job description. But there he was. He was the guy. You know, dads, I think a lot of times we're called in to be the guy. It's not in our job description. It's not expected. It feels like sometimes we're handling snakes. Sometimes the seven foot long boa constrictor. And I did have the video, I just want to tell you, I have the video. I chose not to show it because I figured I didn't want a mass exodus out of the, uh, the, um, the theater here or you guys signing off online. But if you want, you can look at my Instagram, I'll post it today, at David Heiliger, I'll post the seven foot long boa constrictor video. And just so you know, if there are any bad words that you hear in the background of that video, it wasn't me, I promise. We're called in to be the guy, not that guy. I've been that guy before. Have you ever been that guy? You know, the guy that maybe tries to get out of responsibilities, the guy that uh, spills the drink, the guy that stumbles, the guy that maybe is the guy that has the 10-foot pole staying away from danger. You know, not that guy, but to be the guy. The guy that's called in to solve problems. The guy that's called in to handle the difficulties. The guy that's called in to provide. The guy that's called in to handle things when everybody else might be freaking out. Dads, oftentimes, you're the guy. Today, I want to talk about that. Today, I want us to really explore a little bit together what it means to be the guy, to be called in when everybody else is nervous, to be the one that your family can count on, to be the one that your kids count on. I want to talk about the number one pitfall that dads fall into and the practical things that we can do to rise above it. 
What's that number one pitfall that, that holds us back from being the guy and then ends up being that guy? And to celebrate the dads that are the guy, the dads that don't fall into this number one pitfall that threaten our role as dad, as father, as pops, as the old man. And we're going to read some scripture to do it. And so I'm going to ask if you turn to Amos chapter 6, and we're going to read verses 1 through 7. And we're going to talk about this pitfall that sometimes dads and, and guys and really all of us, it's not specifically talking about dads in the scripture. So uh, ladies, those, those of you that don't have kids, these are all things that we can look out for. But specifically, I want to talk about dads today. And this scripture, I mean, I'm sorry. I feel like sometimes scripture has it coming for you. Have you ever felt like scripture is coming at you? Like you're actually reading to make sure that it wasn't written to you or by somebody who has a grudge out to get you, making sure the publishing date wasn't yesterday, that it really was written thousands of years ago. I feel like Amos chapter one, chapter six, verses one through seven sometimes can feel that way. So I promise you, even though this passage is going to be coming down on people pretty hard, it's not going to turn out to be a dad bashing session. Track with me here. So Amos chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Woe to you who are complacent in Zion, and you who feel secure on Mount Samaria, you notable men of the foremost nation, who come to the people, who, to whom the people of Israel come. Do, go to Kalnel, Kalne, and look at it. Go from there to the great Hamath. And then go down to Gath and Philistia. Are they better off than your two kingdoms? Is their lar land larger than yours? And it says this. It says, you put off the day of disaster and you bring near a reign of terror. You lie on beds adorned with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and, fat and fattened calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowl, fill, bowl full and you use the finest lotions, but you do not grieve the ruin of Joseph, your nation. Therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and lounging will end. Now, let's revisit that again because I want to make sure you know I'm not coming down on you, but think about your best Father's Day, okay? Dad's out there. What would be the best Father's Day? To lie on your bed, to lounge on your couch, to eat a nice steak, to drink bowlfuls of wine, <laughs> to listen to your music, to use the finest lotions. This is literally the best Father's Day. And then we have a passage saying, woe to you who end up doing this. But there's a word in there that I think changes everything. Because comfort isn't the enemy. Comfort isn't the problem. It's this word, and it's there in the very first part of the passage. Amos chapter 6, verse 1. Woe to you who are complacent. Complacent. It's a word that talks about our unwillingness to engage. It's willingness to engage with all those sweet, sweet comforts and Get rid of our responsibility. But for those fathers out there that we're celebrating today, we know that you're the types of dads that we would never use that word with, that word complacent. This is the day where we celebrate the good dads. Those fathers out there that are getting after it. Those ones that we have had, that have had influence on our lives. The influence that have shaped us. And we know you can't have influence and be complacent at the same time. So today, let's talk about the three characteristics that we'll find in this passage and some others that combat complacency. What are the three characteristics that combat complacency? Verse three says this. And it kind of reminds me of that guy with the 10 foot Verse 3 says, you put off the day of disaster. 
you put off the day of disaster. The complacent people around in that time were putting off the day of disaster. There was a judgment coming off, and instead of engaging with that which was difficult, instead they had their 10-foot pole, they kept it at a distance, and they said, nah, not me. Calling the guy, because I don't want to be the guy. Avoiding the difficult, avoiding the overwhelming, avoiding the tough topics, avoiding the unknown. The first quality of a dad that has the character trait that combats complacency is courage. Our dads are courageous. Have you guys ever seen your dad step up into something that's unknown and overwhelming? Something that he didn't know what he was doing? Trust me, I'm a dad. I don't know what I'm doing, but I know that my calling goes beyond my confidence. So what happens when your calling goes beyond your confidence? What you need is courage, and courage rooted not in myself, but rooted in the Lord. And that's where we exist as dads. You know, we've positioned our lives in such a way where we're not snake-handling, boa-constrictor, you know, uh, um, saviors. But dads are still called to be the guy that take care of their families in unexpected and unplanned and unorthodox ways. Our kids are working through topics and issues that no one really helped us wrestle with, right? A lot of the things that us as dads have to guide our kids through, the, the unplanned, the unexpected, the overwhelming, the unknown, are things that maybe we never wrestled with when we were kids or teenagers or even young adults. Think about the issues where our kids are having to make wise decisions around gender and sexual health. Our kids are having to wrestle with economic security and making wise financial decisions. They're dealing with mental health and navigating sensitive relational conflict. Did your parents walk you through that one? But here we are, we're dads, and we have to guide our kids through things like that. Not to mention the cultural fluency and respect that's really essential to the kind of community that we're building, even here at Bridgeway. One tough, tough topic that I have ahead of me with my eight-year-old that we've really dove into as much as possible is this idea of racial conflict and cultural division that's all around us. The news stories that keep coming up. How do you talk to an eight-year-old about this in a white family where... Around us, we have such great relationships with people who are different than us. You know, it's a constant thought of mine to wait till she's older. You know, let's just wait until she, maybe she's older and she can handle this a little bit better. It's too hard now, so maybe if I just put this off for a little while longer, it will get easier. And guess what? It never gets easier. So even as we enter a day like today, Juneteenth, that... And in my family, that we get to sit down and talk to my daughter about this. What does it mean that we celebrate the day that enslaved people were told that they're free? Well, in order to talk about the freeing of people who are enslaved, we have to talk about the reality that they were actually enslaved in the first place. And who were the people that were doing the enslaving? And who, who is facing the, the difficulty of that? And how do I have that conversation with my eight-year-old? And it's easy to say, ah, I'll wait until she's older. Or I say, no, we're going to talk about this. And I don't know how to talk about it, but maybe we'll watch some YouTube videos together. Maybe we'll do that. That's a good start. Maybe I'll say to her, you know what? I'm not exactly sure exactly how to talk about all this stuff with you, but I think this is important and we should talk about it. And to step into it and have questions that I don't know how, how they're going to come across and how she's going to ask them, or answer them, or come back at me. And I'll have her sit down with one of our family members, a cousin of hers, who has an Afro-Panamanian uh, um, uh, background, and have her talk to her about the, the joy that comes with Juneteenth and the specialness that, that, it, that, that it has for her. Sometimes being the guy means you call in for backup when things are a little bit beyond your ability. But that's where we go with courage. 
We step into conversation and we step into topics that might be a little bit overwhelming. And sometimes courage is talking. Sometimes courage as a dad is listening and not saying that thing that you want to say. Have you ever thought as a dad what it means to have the courage to listen to our kids? That you say, I hear you. That you say, tell me more. That you say, I'm not going to respond right now, not because I don't have anything to say, but I'm not going to respond because I really just want to understand you. The courage to have compassion. And then, eventually, the courage to act. Those are the places of courage that I think we as dads are called into right now. The next quality of a, of a dad that, that pushes off complacency and runs toward what God has for him is to be consistent. Galatians 6, 9 says, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Do not give up doing good. You know, what are those consistent things that we can do over and over and over again to make sure our kids know we are the type of family that does what? We are the type of family that talks about hard things. We are the type of family that always says, I love you. We are the type of family that spends time together. We are the type of family that eats dinner together. We're the type of family that does what? You know, and I found out from a lot of those shout outs, the things that stood out to kids from their dads are the things that the dads did over and over and over again. So maybe you as a father, you don't want to pick everything to start doing or everything to do or feel like you need to get it all right. But what are the things that you'll be consistent in? I remember uh, when I was first becoming a dad, I was very overwhelmed because I'm the youngest of five. I've never had little babies around, right? And so this idea of changing diapers, I know it sounds silly, but it, it was like so overwhelming to me. I didn't know what to do with that thought that I would have to change diapers. And I was actually walking around the building here at Bridgeway with one of our staff people, Cliff Armstrong, if you remember him. Big Marine dude, like really tough guy. And I was telling him about being a dad, and I was like, I don't know what to do. I really don't know. And the thing that scares me the most, it's funny, but it's changing diapers. And he looks at me and he says, what? He said, that? He said, that was my favorite part about being a dad of a baby. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? He said, you know, there's one time in my relationship with my little babies that I got to be fully present and be so helpful and be so attentive, and that was at diaper changing time. So whenever there was a time to change diapers, he said, I, I volunteered because I could be that guy that comes in and I would always be there to change the diapers and I would poke their little bellies and I would make them laugh. So whenever it was time to change a diaper, he said, I would just, I would volunteer. And I thought, oh my goodness. And I've never forgotten that. That changed everything for me in my relationship with my little girl when she was a baby. That I could be consistent in one thing. Maybe not everything, but one thing, I could be the guy. And that changes over the years. As you talk about hard things and as you uh, have commitments to different games or different activities or different initiatives that they're a part of, but maybe there's one thing that you can say, I'm always going to volunteer for that. I might have to sacrifice. It might not be easy. It might be hard, but I'm going to find a way to bring joy into those moments. I can be consistent. The last piece of this, and maybe even the most important, the third quality of a dad that doesn't fall into complacency is this, that you would be connected. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 32 says, For the waywardness of the simple will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me, the wisdom of the Lord, will live in safety and be at ease without fear or harm. You know, throughout all, the, all of Amos, he's really challenging people to be careful to not fall into injustice and unrighteousness and having this show of religion without having any of the backup of your actions. And he's saying you've got to actually have a real relationship with the Lord if you're actually going to be a person who doesn't end up at this complacent level. 
living in luxury with no real purpose or power. You know, having a connection with the Lord is not just about you and your relationship with the Lord. It's about these demonstrations of what it looks like to have the power of God move through you in your relationships. That they see how you treat your neighbors. That they see how you treat your parents. That your kids see how you talk about your boss. They see how you pursue your calling. They see how you give generously. And not just that they see it, but you live out this connected relationship with the Lord out in your life, but also through your words with them. That you process it externally. That you help them think through these hard decisions in their life. That when they're off in their world, launched off living a powerful life of their own with all of its complexity, that they say, man, how did dad deal with his issues of overwhelm when things didn't seem to go his way? Oh, yeah. He went back to something so much greater than him. He went to the Lord. He read the scriptures. He processed his role in light of his relationship with the Lord. Because I think in every heart of a father, there's something innate where we want to launch our kids off into the world. We want to launch them off to be these amazing, fully functioning, contributing, powerful people, men and women that change the world, that love life and love others. And when we let them go and launch them off, we're not just launching them off into life, but we're launching them off into the hands of the Lord and demonstrating that ahead of time, being connected to God, something that's essential for all of us. I want to tell one last story before we finish up. And it happened a couple of years ago. You know, as I think about that a courageous, a consistent, and connected to the Lord kind of person is a demonstration of what it looks like to be the kind of father I want to be. I think about the time I walked into a bookstore a couple of years ago, and I'm checking out books, and I'm getting my things together, and I walk up to the counter, and as I'm checking out, the woman behind the counter just looks at me, and then she looks down. She looks at me, and then she looks down, and she looks at me. She said, I've got to ask you a question. She said, this might sound odd. She said, is there any chance you're, are you Phil Heiliger's son? I said, yeah, why? Does he owe you money? She said, no, no, no. She said, you know, I went to church with your dad about 20 years ago, and I was pretty sure you're his son. 20 years ago, my dad, you picked that up. She said, you look just like your father. You look just like your father. You look just like your father. And for those of us that when we think about that, as it relates to our earthly fathers, we say, man, that's great in some ways. And we say, wow, I I really hope I'm I'm overcoming some of the challenges that my dad faced as he was a a dad. And as I'm growing into my own being and I think about this, this idea that I look like my dad, You know, the essential piece of being connected to the Lord as a dad is for the purpose that we want to look like our heavenly father. That when somebody looks at us, that when our kids look at us, they would look at us and they would say, you look like your father. He loved with sacrifice. He was consistently committed to you. He was courageous, even in the face of complete unknown and danger. And he demonstrated what it meant to be connected. Fully connected. So fathers, as you lounge on your couch, as you eat your steak, as you listen to your music, maybe even as you drink your bowl full of wine, I want you to remember we do that on Father's Day because the next day when we wake up, we get back to the grind. And we work hard to be courageous, 
to be consistent, to be connected, to be dad. Happy Father's Day. Amen and amen.